Father God, we're grateful for your love and your goodness to us in this Sabbath day and the opportunity we have to be together as we share this morning in this uh, short seminar. We pray for your presence, lead and guide and direct us as you would have us to learn in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We don't have to be the first in line for dinner. We don't? No. Oh, okay. Well, I will be. <laughs> <laughs> I will be, so you'll want to follow me. I, are there markers for the board or not? Probably not. Okay, well, you get... You, uh, I didn't ask you to find those. Thank you. <clears throat> the elusive devotional life. Does that ring a bell? A little bit? There are times when it's wonderful, powerful, and you think, I am really connecting, and other times you say... What in the world happened? Where did I go wrong? Why am I not connecting with this? Welcome to normal devotional life. Now, I'm not here to tell you this morning that I have all the answers for this, okay? But I enjoy uh, learning together and finding out and hearing from other people's experiences. Some things work for me. Sometimes I really connect. Sometimes it's like, oh, man, and I'm supposed to be a professional and know how to do all this all the time and, and be the shining example. So I'm already telling you, what you're not supposed to do as a presenter, and that is, I'm not perfect in this. Some days are good, some days are bad, some days I'm lost, some days I'm saying that's just what I need. Um, for Christmas or somewhere, we got a, a little book called Jesus Calling by Sarah Yanni. Just short little paragraphs. Man, some days I think those are just written for me. I'll read that and go, wow, okay, I get it. That's pretty clear. Boom, right in my face. It's what I needed and what I needed to hear. It resonates. I think about it throughout the day. Sometimes I read them and like, well, this must just be for females. Right? <laughs> right? This is a female thing. We're, we're, I'm not connecting. All right. <clears throat> so I, I think when we talk about the devotional life, that's what we're talking about, walking the walk, walking the talk, however you want, you want to say it. And you've already heard consistently from last night and today, young people are looking to be loved. If you don't love yourself, it's hard to love other people, isn't it? Pretty, pretty common, common stuff. So what is, what is the devotional life? What it is, what it isn't. Let's, let's start there. Number one, it is an invitation to allow God ultimate control of your day. Who's in charge of your day? Well, it doesn't, does, when you hear Brenda talk, does it sound like she has given her day to somebody? It's not her agenda, is it? Right. No. <laughs> Okay, so the devotional life simply, good, thanks for getting those out. If somebody needs some, there's plenty of them. It's, it's an invitation to allow God control of your day. When does that happen? In this, in this wonderful, and there hasn't been a wrong answer, and there's been seven. That's, how, that's going to be my approach to the devotional life. I think we reflect upon how we were trained and, and taught growing up. I was taught that devotional life has to be and look a certain way. It has to contain certain elements. It has to be the package. Okay, and the package starts when? In early in the morning. And if you're not an early in the morning person, you're, in trouble. You, <laughs> you're immediately at what? At odds, aren't you? You're in a struggle. You're going, I don't do this. And thankfully, we're learning even through the educational processes. We all don't learn the same way, do we? I love to be read to. Read me a story. I traveled with a friend. We traveled across the country. He hated to drive, but he loved to read. How are we going to make this trip? You don't drive. Well, but we've got to get there. We've got a certain amount. Okay, you read. Read? Andy, his eyes lit up. So you read to me, and I drove what? 2,500 miles. <laughs> Good, you know, and don't stop. Okay, put a tape in. Let me hear a, hear a story. Tell me a story. Okay, it works for me. Um, <clears throat> some people don't, don't learn that. They need to be hands-on. I'm not good hands-on. Don't, don't ask me to make something or to create something. Oh, Read to me and tell me, okay? How do you learn, how do you learn at a sermon? They all, 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 always connect, do we, with, with the spoken word? 
But I, some of you could ask, what did the preacher wear last week? What did the flowers look like? What contributed to your worship experience? Okay, was it the music? Was it the organ? Was it a hymn you sang? Was it a poem somebody read? Was it something else that happened experientially in that at service? Maybe it wasn't just the spoken words. We all have these different tools. The same way with your devotional life. Okay, we're gonna, we need to find out what connects for you, okay? But again, this is an invitation to allow God what? Okay? You're saying, look, I am not in charge of this whenever it happens, but God, I'm giving you an invitation to come in and direct my life. Number two, it's an opportunity for spiritual and emotional connection. If your devotional life isn't connecting you spiritually and emotionally, you need to reevaluate that and see what's happening. And you're going to see this is going to become a little more clearer when we <coughs> define what it isn't, okay? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Connie. What's the focus? James 4, 7. That I might what? Know, know God and know him more abundantly, knowing more fully, know more about him. Okay? So the focus on devotion is what? Okay? So I'm going to keep it really simple for you. Okay? There's, there's just one, one focus. It's not, on, um, it's not on accomplishing something. And now, now I'm going to, some of you are going to stay with me for a little bit before you get upset. Sometimes devotional lives are approached by, I've got to get through how many chapters? Okay? Now I'm not saying that's bad. Some of us need that structure. And sometimes once we get into that structure, it keeps us going and works. If it works for you, what? Cling to it. Celebrate it. Uh, enjoy it, okay? I, it's hard for me. Because well, I'll get behind. <laughs> and I'm two weeks into the new Bible reading for the year, and I'm what? Oh, it's February, and I'm still on January 8. Right? I'll never, I'll never, I'll, I'll never... Yeah, some of you relating to that? Yes. And I'm saying already I'm what? I'm a failure. This isn't working. This thing is no good for me. Well, I can't keep up. Okay? Others of you need that, that okay? I'm going to get through this. Okay? And, and your grit and determination get you through it, and God works and, and uses that. That's wonderful. But as long, if your focus is on getting through, it might be possible to miss what? Okay, so I want, I, that's why, that's why I'm, I'm heading you in maybe a little different direction than, than you're used to thinking on this. If your focus remains God, then you be true to your focus, and whatever system, whatever applications works for you, do that. Okay? We all, were we all okay with that so far? Mm -hmm. All right. So, and, and if that makes you uncomfortable, hang on a little bit, because you'll get more uncomfortable. What, is, what it is not, okay? It's not primarily a systematic, watch this, Bible study. Are you with me? Why, why would I say that? Well, my focus in a systematic Bible study might not be who? Might not be. See, this resonates with collegiates. All week long, what are they doing? Systematic, quote, study. Systematic say they got to get through it. They got to get the material in. They got to accomplish that because if they don't, they're going to fail the, the test. Okay, what's the test for good devotional life? What? I know him. I know him. I know him better. How do I test that? Well, Ms. Brenda would say she's. Taking opportunities to, to, to witness. Talk about him. Okay. How do I how do I know that I know God better? Trust. Do what? You get excited about it. Yeah. I find that it affects me throughout the day. I have moments where I can. Oh wow. Wait a minute. Slow down. Think about that. Oh, do you know what just happened? Or did I miss an opportunity? Or is this an opportunity? Okay. Whose agenda am I on for the day? Mine or, mine or God's? 
okay? So if my devotional life's got to continue to, to, to point me to that. So it's not primarily a systematic Bible study. I'm not speaking ill of Bible study, okay? But I've, I'm coming off a, a college campus for the last six years uh, doing the dean of students' work. That was really interesting. Um, when you're seen as the campus cop, the ultimate one who makes the decisions on whether they get punished or not, it's kind of a different role than being a chaplain. Okay, or being... <clears throat> okay, where you, where you kind of come in. But I found that they don't want to go to Sabbath school. I mean, in school, what? All week long. Sabbath, I don't want... So, but, so yeah, we call it something different. And if you've noticed, that's all popular now. You hardly hear Sabbath school. Because especially on the collegiate campus, we've got to give it a different name or something, okay? Do they want to come and study in a systematic way? Very rarely, okay? What's probably missing in most of their lives is some type of devotional life, which their focus is on God, not material, okay? Nothing wrong with the material, Please don't leave here and say, boy, he's anti. I, the material's great. Well, they need that. We need it. We need to infuse our, our devotional life with good material. Okay, but that's not the focus of a devotional life. So what goes on to number two? Research and details are not the primary purpose. Okay, I've seen some come in and, and, and they were going to have a devoted, a devoted devotional life. They are going to do it. And they've got the map. They've got the research tools. They've got the books and the commentaries, okay? And you can study yourself into oblivion <laughs> and miss who? That's to, and it's hard, hard to correlate sometimes, but it's possible to study so much and be something you don't know who. It's, it's possible for preachers to, do, to be about the work of the Lord that they forget the Lord of the work. Or the Lord, yeah, okay? So don't let that happen in your devotional life. Is there a time for research and study? You bet there is. And there's a time for devotional food. And I'm, so I'm trying to make that, that difference for you just, just a little bit here. Number three, it's not academic in preparation or intellectual achievement. Uh, sometimes when you're involved in preparing uh, spiritual lessons for young people or for others... You can get caught up in the details and make sure everything's right, and then some want to count that as devotional life. <laughs> okay? Uh, I have to be careful I don't count sermon prep as devotional life. I'm reading good stuff, I'm doing research and doing materials again, and I'll parse a verb or two maybe. Those are Greek things that you learn to do when you take theology, okay? Everybody goes, who cares? Okay, but boy, if I'm studying, doing that preparation. But if it's not helping me know more about God, then I don't consider it devotional. Okay, and I, that's, just, that's just for me. Speak, share. You see the difference? I, I, does it make sense to you then? Okay, so what is a devotional life? What it is not is it's not what? For, uh, for, ter for the term, yeah, for, for us, it's not a systematic research doctrinal preparation. Okay, rather it is a emotional, spiritual connection time that allows me to, to know more about who God is. Okay? Okay, so, so now that we've got those two separated, any other questions or observations on that? Thank you. And that's, that's a very valid point. Devotion time, but something in knowing more God is pretty valid. And perhaps that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You don't set out, you haven't set out to do that. Or I would say in your devotional life, that's where you want to head. That target right there where you oh man, God has revealed himself to me. That's what I'm really trying to trying to accomplish in a devotional setting when I'm not necessarily trying to accomplish that in a 
uh, um, research setting or a uh, preparation setting. But yeah, good, and that happens, and I wouldn't deny that at all. Good, good point. Very valid point. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, here we go. Here's, here's the challenge for us. Two words. Knowing God. Great words. That, and that would work here. What did you say? Do it. See, this is, do it. Great, two good words. Wonderful. I love it. When I taught a youth ministry class. My first, uh, I had about, the first year, I think, well, it first started with one person. I did it one-on-one. Then the next year it grew on to three, and we were doing it. And then they said, well, maybe we should have a class. So we had a class. We had 14. Okay, the first year of that class, I sat there, and I said, okay, I want you to, t- t- tomorrow, here's our paper. We would do thought papers and kind of stuff. I tried to be a little more creative than just give me back stuff. I said, I want you to tell me what you think. Hands went up. What do you want? So well, I want you to tell me what you think about. What are you looking for? I want you to tell me what you... And I found out I had 14 students that really all they could do was parrot. Parrot back to me what they thought I wanted to hear. And, and we struggled for a couple of weeks. Well, what do you mean? Well, well here's, what, here's what I think, but what if that's not what you... Okay, what do I want? I want to know what you think, and I want you to support what you think. Okay, I might agree, I might not agree. So then we'll have a discussion. I said, but I, I need, boy, they struggled with that. But at the end of the semester, we were having a great time. Hmm? Because they, could, they knew it was safe. Okay, and they were going to not get tested on what I expected, but they were going to be tested on what they believed. Okay, so what do you think I put down here? Nothing. <laughs> Two words. Two words. The first one's slow. (laughs) Slow down. We live in a fast, fast paced world, don't we? This little thing. Who doesn't have one? Good for you. You have an old one. I'm the only one. You're the only one. At work, at home. (laughs) Slow down. I can remember a day being at home when the phone would ring as a child and nobody would move because we didn't want to go answer the phone. (laughs) If we were eating, it was mealtime. I don't want to answer the phone. That interrupts what? Family and the food. <laughs> you bet. And I didn't miss many of those, as you can tell. But still, it was, that was, the phone was an interruption. Today, it's a what? <laughs> we interrupt conversations to answer the phone. Mm-hmm. We interrupt business. We interrupt meals. We interrupt because the phone's ringing. Okay? It's just, it's just a different. We have got to, as a people, learn to what? To slow down. Something I wrote down it was what people were saying. In the two words, so we have slow down, do it, know God. Know what? Know God. Know God, yes. Yes, so if you slow down, yeah. do it, know God. Who was it when God said, I st- speak to you in a loud, roaring voice? No, I speak to you how in a still, small, small voice. voice. <laughs> okay, he will speak also in a loud voice because sometimes that's the only voice we hear. Okay, but that's still small voice. If you don't slow down, you're not going to hear it. Phew. And I think that when I take time to connect with God in a devotional experience, He allows me to slow down throughout the experiences of the day and say, Oh, yeah, oh, you remember that little paragraph? Or you remember that text? You share? Here is an application of that in your life. Uh, slow down so that you can apply it. Okay, so, so we all are going to slow down. If you do that, I think something will happen to your devotional life. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Here is the most form you'll probably get uh, from me. Our, our, well, no, I'll give you a little more on the next page. Our minds are easily led astray, true or false? Yes. 
Sure. And not, not just our modern mind. So I don't, we're, I'm not just spanking us today because of the culture and times in which we live. Paul said it as well. Okay, you're busy with ministry prep and details. How many of you teach at Sabbath school? Does that just happen Friday night or Sabbath morning? <laughs> I know you. You're working on it when? All day long. All experiences from now. You do, as soon as you finish, you're getting ready for the next one. It just doesn't quit. They, they, they come all the time. You, you're looking, you're reading, you're seeing, you're hearing. And that, that can occupy your time. Good stuff? Yeah. Good stuff. Self-sufficient attitude. I can do this. I can get it all done. I don't need anybody else to help me. Matter of fact, if I want it done, I'll do it. What? Myself. If, <laughs> if I want it done right, <laughs> if I want it done the way I want it done, I'll do it myself. Okay, it's more work to ask somebody. Oh, yeah. Meeting our own needs with things of the world. Ooh. Not disciplined. See, Paul, Paul leads all these things in his day and time were active. These are all things that take your mind away and, and, and keep you going. How long do we go till? 12, 15? So, so I'm done. Good. Okay. And I, so I just, I'm not going to fill in the blanks for you there, but you, you can add your personal challenges. Okay, what is it? Is it your work schedule, your exercise schedule, meetings. meals, meetings, other things that, that crowd in and keep you, keep your mind led astray from doing the stuff. Um, I, his first name was Charles. I wish I could remember the name. He founded uh, a bunch of children's orphanages in Germany. Some of you remember his name. It, it just has eluded me. He, uh, he was known for his devotional life. Yeah, I think so. That sounds right. Thank you. Um, he and, uh, would make passages across the ocean from Germany over the U.S. and speak. And everybody praised his devotional life. And one time in, in a very exclusive exchange, he says, he says, I don't deserve a lot of credit for my devotional life. He says, it is work. And the people were just like, ooh, what do you mean it's work? He says, you just don't know what kind of work it is. He said, well, how can it work? It just seems so natural for you. And it, it flows out. And he says, you, you, you get up and you pray and, and you, you meditate and you have devotions for two, three hours a day. He says, you know my secret? Of course, everybody's just hanging on every word. He says, I keep a bucket of ice water under my bed. And at 3 o'clock when I wake up in the morning, I stick my head in the bucket. People just looked at him. That's your secret? He says, yeah. So if I didn't put my head in a bucket of ice water at 3 a.m., I'd still be asleep. And he said, but I know that i got to put my head in the bucket of ice water because I need two or three hours before I come out and talk to people like you. Whoa. Great secret. Head in the bucket of ice water. Okay. Did it work for him? I guess so. Would it work for you and me? No. No? I don't know. He has it real quick. No, thanks. Okay. But he found out what he had to do to make his devotional life work and get him off, get his mind away from, from those kind of things. So you just add some stuff there that you don't have to share with everybody, but you know what they are. On the next page, uh, let's see. Do we want to spend more time on the problem? The challenge? Anybody not need to slow down? <laughs> yeah, not need to slow down. Good, okay, here we go. Here's the solution. And I don't mean this as the ultimate or final solution. These are suggestions for you, okay? Dev what does devotion mean? Anybody know what the word means? It's a, it's a great word. To what? Commitment? Close to devote to something means to set it what? Set it apart. Very good. So devotions means to have a time, a place, or something that, that you set apart. Uh, that implies uh, that it's important. Okay? So to set apart as important. Mark 135. Who has a Bible with them that will read that for us? Mark 135. 
This is what, this is what we based uh, the devotional life on. Uh, this text is sort of the foundational uh, scriptural passage for, for a devotional life because it worked for Jesus. Mark 1, 35. First one just... just and, in, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Have you heard that text before? Mm-hmm. And very wet... <laughs> and morning people are already saying, no, not happening. I'm a morning person, somewhat. I, seem, I feel like I get a lot more done in the morning times than I do in the afternoon, and it's probably because of a heavy lunch, right? Kind of like, oh, man, half the day's gone. Breakfast, good stuff, and look forward to that. Get good more done in the morning. Jesus, did this work for Jesus? Okay, this was his pattern his ideal he set it up okay very early when so the time is morning Morning. is that the only time no but for jesus it was the time okay so if we follow his example there must something must be said for the morning and advantages to the morning would be Less less distractions you're fresh you're rested Ready, ready to start the day, set the program for the day. You don't have the day's troubles already on your mind. The day's troubles aren't already on your mind, hopefully. <laughs> Anything else? Start the day with God. Start the day with God. Okay. The, what was the location? It's a place. The location was away. So we went away. Now, a lot of implications to that. What does away mean for you here? Okay, could be by yourself. So solitude, maybe. Could be also location, couldn't it? He went away from what was familiar to him. The, 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 okay. You ever hear Tony Campalo tell the story of uh, uh, being contacted by a girl in his classroom who said her father was dying. He wasn't... A, she said she was somewhat secure about his eternal life, but would he just go and check on him and, and make a, a visit? She had a lot of confidence in him as a pastor and preacher. And so he went to visit the guy in the hospital. And um, next to his hospital bed was a chair. Okay, and as Tony conversed with this guy, and they began to talk about prayer and devotional life, and uh, the guy in, in the bed says, you know, sometimes I just feel so distant I'm so dis. He says, all my life, I've known God, knew about him, had all the stuff together. He says, but there's been a gap. He says, I don't know how to close that gap. Tony says, I'm not here to give you any great theological interpretation, he says, but you need to know that, that God is right here with you. That his presence is here. He's concerned for you. And then Tony looks at this chair and he says, God sits in this chair next to you in this bed. And he said, converse with him. Have that conversation. Establish and re- that reconnection with God right here next to your chair. Tony left, I guess a week or two later, I don't know the exact details, but the girl contacted Tony and said that her father had died. And Tony said, well, I had a wonderful visit with him, and we talked about prayer and everything. She says, you know, well, when Dad died, she said, the nurses and everybody said something was, was really strange. He said he was actually kind of out of his bed, and he had pulled the chair close to him, and he said he was kind of embracing the chair when he passed. Mm-hmm. Tony says, yeah, let me, let me unpack that for you. Okay. See, the connection, the connection was made. Okay? And, and so a way can be hot. Might be a location, might be, some, might be a spot. There is a quiet place far, far away. Okay? I, I don't do <laughs> devotions well in front of the TV. Now, music can help. <laughs> okay? Some of my... Most memorable, I think, devotional times of connection with God have, have in, included music. 
as part of that, that process, okay? So, so a way, location, what was the method? Exactly. It was what? It was prayer. Okay, morning, away, and prayer. Kind of foundational stones, kind of a framework for the solution to, to a successful devotion. It worked for Jesus, it ought to work for us. That's the example he, he put out there for us, okay? Now, don't get discouraged if you're not a morning person. Don't get discouraged if you don't like getting away or your uh, location and stuff. Don't get discouraged like the man in the bed, if you're having trouble making that bridge and that connection to prayer, stay with me and we'll close with something I think that'll help. What is, uh, how, how does that look for you as a package? Break that down for me a little bit. I mean, it's not, obviously, it's not overly complicated. Is it practical in today's world? Anybody else want to add to that? Personal experiences. Those of you that aren't morning people, well, I'm, yeah, my problem is that I stay up super late doing everything else, um, so it's really hard to wake up in the morning, but what has helped me is um, waking up and then exercising with someone, and then so, like, we'll exercise first, and then um, and then I'll have my devotion, and what I realized is <coughs> the days that I skip exercising, then I look at the clock, and I'm like, eh, I can, I only need this much time to get ready, and I don't account for how much time I need to get ready on the inside as well as the outside, and so I just account for just how much time time is going to take me to, to get ready for work, and I cut out that devotional time, but for me what has been helpful to have that devotional time in the morning was exercising before having my time with God. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. That's good. I have a problem with my mind waking up, and I can be moving around and getting ready, and I've tried reading in the morning, I fall asleep while I'm reading, you know, kind of, and, I, <coughs> and then I try to listen to the Sabbath school on my phone while I'm getting ready, but then I've got to carry it everywhere, because if I sit in the bathroom and I'm going in here, then I'm missing what they're saying. But what i found that I think works the best, because I have to wake up, is that I get to my classroom early before anybody's in the building, and my door is closed and just my lamp is on at my desk. And I can read my devotion. Mm. And that has really worked for me. I'm, I'm awake. I'm there before everybody is there. And I can hear God talking. But in the morning, I, my, my brain is just not, it's, it just doesn't wake up enough for me to, to get in. I'm more going through the motion. And I don't really feel like I've made the connection. Okay. Good. And I see you kiss. <coughs> I have to um, get up. I could try the cold bucket of water method, but I haven't tried that. But I have to get up. I have to like be leaving my house at 6.15 to get to work. So that means I'm getting up at 5.15-ish. I, I can't just see getting up any earlier. So what I started to do, I have um, scripture songs in my car because I have to drive about an hour to get to work. And then I have the devotional delivery set up for me on my computer. So when I get to work, I do the same thing. I then open my devotional reading for the day. Um, and you know, I pray, of course, before I leave the house. But other than prayer, that's pretty much all that, that I get until I get to work. And then I do it there. Good. Yes. Can I mention just briefly for the for the medical aspect of it? I've had problems with sleep myself, and um, just want to mention in case it helps anyone else. Uh, the body goes through 90 minute sleep cycles throughout the night. Um, body makes melatonin before the hours of midnight, and a couple things: if people are going to bed later and later, they're going to have these problems of waking up. If you're waking up in the middle of a sleep cycle, that's going to be another thing. You are going to be sleepy. It's just the way the body is made. And so, just little things to kind of pay attention to. Sleep cycle starts when you first get sleepy. If you fight it, you're going to be wide awake. And then after 90 minutes again, you're going to be sleepy again. So if you're fighting the medical aspect of it, if you don't have a brief knowledge of it or can do a little bit of research on it, you all can establish that point as far as getting up early in the morning. So that's helped me out personally. Yeah, just like he says, being a devotional time is throughout our lifestyle. Uh, if you eat heavy meal and uh, fatty food, 
night before you want to get up and have a devotion, you're going to have a hard time getting up and doing things. If you're not exercising and doing things throughout the day, yeah, in the morning you're going to be tired because your body is already tired. So having devotion and all is just seven days, 24 hours, uh, in tune with God. Everything that we do has to be glorify Him. Then we could have a truly devotion time with Him. And that's what I'm finding out. If I'm doing good things that God, out of what needs to be done, living a health life, have a healthful life, getting up in the morning to have a devotion, it's tough. It's very, very tough. getting up at 5.15. I mean, early already. So if yours is working for you, yeah, 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 that's fine. That's right. Good. I know the the thing I I find is that if I do get up early and it does have a factor with you know when the sun rises and everything, but get up even if I start out at dark, <coughs> right before the sun comes up and start on a walk. And just mm. go out on a walk. Well, I live out in the woods, so I go on walk, a prayer walk, and that's all I do is I get up and I go on a prayer walk, and I'll walk a mile or two, walk on a prayer walk, and then when I come back, I have a little place that I just slip off into the woods, and and then take time again to you know if I throw a book in there or something, I'll be there for me when I get back to kind of because I'm awake. Mm. God's had a time to talk to me. He's got a time to get me awake, and then. I find that during that time he speaks to me so clearly that I, I literally need to get out of the house. Because mm. if I'm in the house, I'm a doer. So oh, there's, some, there's something that needs to be done. And so if I'm in the house, always unless I'm in the tub done. with a book, I, I'm doing something. Away. Away is a key. Good. All right. We'll keep moving here. I'll try to get us out on time. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing with that. I think we can all uh, learn some from our experiences. Jesus focused on who? On his Father. He focused on God. That was, and this is sometimes hard even for me, like theologically. He is what? You know, he is God, and yet his time and devotion was spent on his Father and his relationship in that whole Trinity network. Don't get that confused with the TV station. But the, the whole, the, this whole concept, man, that must, it must have been vital to his day-to-day -day existence. Who is my father? What is my father about? Okay? Um, and, and those attributes. Enter into the setting of the Psalms. Oh, excuse me. Explore the attributes of God. What are some attributes of God? Just throw those out real quick. I don't know if I'll be able to keep up with them. What are attributes of God? Peace, patience, love, faithfulness, joy. The fruits of the Spirit are what? Attributes of who God is. Okay. Can, does the world need a little more focus on the attributes of God? You know, and even, even the world's view of God is pretty arbitrary. He's to blame, isn't he? Insurance people blame acts of Acts of God. You know, let's make sure we get that in there. Acts of who? Acts of God, really? Well, I guess if God's ultimately in control, that he, might, he, could, he could probably handle that. But when was the last time you saw God positively portrayed in a TV sitcom? Through a competent preacher. Usually they're what? Aloof, absent-minded, out of touch. Right? Okay, the whole thing. Attributes of God. Focus on the attributes of God in, in your thoughts, in your planning. Um, that little movement that happened a few years ago now, WW, what would Jesus do? The bracelets, the posters. A great question. And I think it's a very fair uh, posture to take to slow down and say, well, what would Jesus do in this situation? At best, here's my disclaimer, <laughs> at best we do what we think our, Je our, our picture of Jesus would do. Right? But if this devotion thing, and we explore his attributes, and exploring his attributes and our devotions, we're going to have more of those attributes, and we're going to be more inclined to know what he would do. I, I believe that's going to be a byproduct of a, of, a, of a 
fruitful devotional life. Okay, because I know there are people who have pictures of Jesus that are different than mine. She came in, she came into church, a real story. I knew the family, had married one of the daughters, and um, <clears throat> hadn't seen this girl, teen girl, since she was about nine or ten, and she's now sixteen or so. And I saw her in town. Didn't recognize her. She came up to me, gave me a big hug. Oh, how are you? You know, and I didn't want to, my face to reveal shock. And and then my, once she talked, we, yeah. but I didn't recognize her. She'd gone gothic. Is that the right word? Black, every black hair, eyebrows, black lipstick, um, <clears throat> black clothing, black boots. She was just a white Caucasian girl, black. Best best way I can describe it. And I don't didn't really know what all it meant, but I just told her. And I, I prayed for the right word and said, it's good to see you. Come back and see me at church. Come, just come see me. I haven't seen you there for a while. She said, oh, I haven't been for a while. She says, you know, I just might. I said, I'd love to see you. Lo and behold, I don't remember the time frame, but it was a month or two. She comes through the front doors of the church. More black than she was when I saw her at the mall. And she's got piercings here and here and in her nose, all up and, I mean, you could have hung a shower curtain from her ear. You know how she had that many things going on up in there. And uh, I saw her, but I was across in the lobby. I saw her come through and I began to make my way, but somebody else saw her and got to her first by the time I got there, I heard the last of, and get dressed appropriately when you come to church. And she turned to leave. And I grabbed her arm. I said, Boy, good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Said, you might be, but not everybody else is. And we had quite a little. Bit. So our picture of what? What would Jesus do? The good deacon who saw her said no. You know, I know you too, but you go home and get dressed appropriately. Was she dressed appropriately? Yes. The Bible says to Matthew. Thank you. Yeah. According to my picture of what exactly. Jesus is, okay? So what would Jesus do? Great question, but at best we do what we think our, our Jesus w- would do. Okay, and you want to get in, into good thoughts for your devotion. Like what would Jesus say to Lance Armstrong? <laughs> Don't lie. All is forgiven. If we confess our sins. Or the lies of a deceitful man follow him the rest of his... See, okay. See what I'm saying? If they do. But but let's... Yeah, exactly. But but, but what would our picture of Jesus say to... to, Okay, you, you know where I'm going. Enter into the setting of the Psalms. Okay, when I think of somebody that had a devotional, rich experience, I think of David. His ability to write of his experiences, often away, often uh, attributes of God. The Lord is my what? Shepherd. Shepherd. He wasn't in in front of his, uh, any electronics or anything. He was where? He was away in a saying, Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. Man, he makes me to lie down in. He restores. You see, when your devotional life is focused on God, restoration takes place. Restoration doesn't always take place when I'm prepping. Restoration doesn't always take place if I'm doing a, a, a discourse or a systematic, you know, and my Greek teacher would tell you that. He would say, <laughs> okay, here we go. Experience the emotion of music. I don't know what, um, I've just loved music from a young age, okay, and these videos that go viral on YouTube with little kids are often associated with mm-hmm. something triggers. These kids don't learn this stuff. They haven't watched and studied it. What? It's in them. And it's emotive, and it's in a response to rhythm and, and music and words that they don't even understand, mm-hmm. right? Okay, but there's a response that takes place 
age appropriately to, to music. Uh, I'm on a Friday night vespers at the college church. It's Easter time. And uh, a young lady got up to sing a song about Jesus being risen. I can't remember the song or anything, but man, I needed the resurrected Savior in my life at that time. I needed to know that there was hope beyond the grave and that something was alive and happening. And at the end of her song, I found myself on my, on my feet with my hands up in the air. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't plan it. <laughs> I didn't orchestrate it. I didn't, I just, it was just one of those moments. And I, I don't do that. I, you know, I might, but, I, and there I was, and it was, I was there, I guess, for a little bit until somebody nudged me. And, oh, I looked around, and I was the only one standing, a few people looking. Huh? Now I'm embarrassed, you know, like, oh, hey, I'm the chaplain. <laughs> I better, but I sat down. But what happened? The emotion. You look through any great things that happen in, in history, they're often associated movements with what? Music. Anybody remember General Noriega? <laughs> the evicted was Panamanian president, corrupt, had fled, fled to Miami. Okay, and there was uh, orders to, to remove him. Police, he was holed up in, in a, in a uh, building. They couldn't get him. Three, four day standoff. Fifth day, they brought in music. ACDC, <laughs> heavy metal rock and roll, set the speakers up outside the building and turned it up. Less than 12 hours later, he walked out of the building. I what? <laughs> Surrender. All right, just the power, not, not the guns, not the threats, the what? Music. Okay, powerful emotion. Music, and most of us have been affected by it. Are you affected by this young little girl that expresses music beyond her turn? I mean, it's unreal. Does she have life experience to back all that up yet? No. But do you think she's convicted of what she's saying? I do. So, but, but at age appropriate, and I'll just throw in a little commercial here because it, it does bother me, but when I go into a praise service and children are singing, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee in first and second grades. Come on. It's what? Nice little tune, nice little melody. Great message, but it doesn't connect with first and second graders. Okay? And what, what has happened, I think, <clears throat> maybe even theologically as we've gone through this devotional life, this is what it all looks like. So this must be praise and worship. And if it works for young adults or youth, then we what? Well, we better, we better work for children too. No. It's still okay for these things... These kids would be saying, Jesus loves me. If you're happy and you know it, why? Happy hand. Maybe not here. Okay, but here it's what? Age appropriate. They can connect and relate to that music. Let them develop and grow into as the deer panteth for the water. So my soul long at that. Does the young adult understand that? How about an adult? Yeah. Here? Uh -uh. I, don't, I don't think so. Okay, so it's all on this progress of the great powerful emotion of, of music can aid your worship service. Personalize the time. Okay, some of you are probably good journalists. You can journal, write a letter, express yourselves. I find that I like to take a little time to do thank you notes. I know they're old-fashioned and everything, but we just had a little Bible conference and the sponsors come, you know, some 40 sponsors that come with academy age kids to watch over them for the weekend at, at camp. And I said, I'll bet they haven't had a thank you note for a long time. So, yeah, it took a little time, but I wrote a thank you note to all 40 people. Man, <laughs> you know, I think I could have been elected something. <laughs> you know, nobody had taken the time to what? Thank him. So, when was the last time you thanked God? I know we do it verbally, but have you written something out? Have you taken the time to do that? Some of you can write out praise. You write music, uh, poems, devotional type of things. Take, take the time to do that. Um, prayer partners. Okay. I, you know, I'm, I'm maybe a little different. My prayer time and devotional time is much more personal than it is public. And, and I don't mind 
you know, every once in a while. Some of you get really connected and energized by, I have, I have friends I know that they call each other every day. Every day. Well, it's just a couple minutes or whatever. For me, that's kind of, uh, feels a little pedantic. But it might work for you. Might might be a connection. Some of the most successful uh, relationships we find with AA or stop smoking is to have a what? An accountability partner. Okay, and if that's how you want to look at this, uh, that's fine. Somebody who's checking in with you. That personal one you can eyeball, touch, feel, and know, and you're making a connection with that for your devotional life. Oh, man, i got to go fly. Here we go. Acts, A-C-T-S. Praise God for who he is. What do we call that? Adoration. Okay? Adoration. Praising God for who he is. You know what? i get my other little hobby horse here just a little bit. We, we, haven't, we aren't doing that as well as we could be. Can I, can I say that? We don't, we don't praise God for who he is like we ought to. Mm-hmm. Recognizing the sovereign awesomeness of who God is. To me, that's what worship should be more about. Okay, quote me on this and I'll deny it. But what is happening, I think, in, in a lot of our churches is that worship is becoming teaching. We even call it the teaching ministry or the teaching of when, when, we, when we introduce. There's a time for that in, in, in our church service. It's called Sabbath school or whatever you want to call it. That's the teaching time. The worship time ought to be more of a big celebration of who God is so that the little one understands or begins to get a picture of the awesomeness of who God is. And the, and the, the established member resonates by celebrating the awesomeness of who God is and the sovereignty of what he does for us in our day-to-day life. We, 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 there's a gap. We now, I mean, we're going to worship services and we're filling out <coughs> study guides. We're filling in the blanks. <laughs> okay? See, this is teaching. This isn't, this isn't worship and adoration in my, in my book. And I, know, and I don't want to offend any of your pastors or anything. I have the greatest respect for pastors who week after week have to stand and present the Word of God to people. Okay, but I'd sure like to see us move toward more adoration and a celebration of who God is than, than the teaching mode. Okay, now I'm in trouble. Uh, admit to God where you failed and receive His forgiveness. What do we call that? Confession. Confession. Okay, a confession. Man, confession is good for the soul. It's just good for the soul. Okay, and if you don't slow down, you won't confess. Okay, till the officer pulls you over. <laughs> and, and he'll ask, do you know how fast you were going? And you're still not ready to confess, right? You might know, but you don't want to admit. You might not know because you don't want to admit you didn't know. See, you got caught in that. Okay? Confession is good for the what? Good for, if we confess our sins, God is what? Faithful and just to forgive us and, and to cleanse us. Confession is good for the soul. Corporate confession is good for the church. Been many a time I've been in a new congregation and you run into a former member or a member who's not coming. And, the, and often the stories can be repeated. I was offended by somebody in church. It, it was very rare that they had a theological disagreement. <laughs> For, in my experience, very rare. Occasionally, somebody was really at odds. But usually it was, do you know what they did to me? Boom, 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 boom. Okay, I'm the new pastor. What do I do? Yeah. That's what I did. I apologized. I apologized. How much did that cost me? <laughs> Nothing. But you know how many times the next response was, you're the first one. You're the first one to say, you're sorry this happened to me. I said, well, I am. But come back. There's a new sheriff in town. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, it's time to come back. Maybe those people are gone and, and it was wrong. I'm sorry the way you were treated. Okay? And uh, thank God for all he's done for us and will do for us. Thanksgiving. Okay. Thanksgiving. And ask God for help. That's called supplication. Very good. A-T-C-S. 
supplication. All right? Pour your heart out, out to God. We, we do probably the best through this. Well, I, I need help. But now we've got to remember, if you ask for help... <laughs> yeah, you know... Okay. Hindsight is 2020, everybody said. Well, it ought to be. But how many of us get up and do the same thing again and again? Okay. Hindsight ought to be 2020. <laughs> okay. But supplication. Ask God. Say, look, this thing's bigger than I am. Okay. I don't have all the answers. God, I need your help. All right. Here we go. Well, let me close up with this little, little thought. A vibrant devotional life. And I'm going to let you help determine what that is for you. Will cause you to grow in Christ. Okay? When I put those seeds in the ground, if I'm faithful at watering them, fertilizing them, taking good care of the right temperature, if I do those things, what's going to happen to those seeds? They're just going to grow. Okay? I can't grunt. No, I can't say I'm not going to water you in the morning. I, you know, but if I do those things to that plant, it'll grow. It just will. You'll grow in Christ regardless of how you might occasionally feel. Very good. You guys are getting it. Pretty sharp group here. If you are deliberate in your approach, a better devotional life is inevitable. Okay? And don't confuse that with it being works-oriented. Okay? I know. It's, uh, and that, that goes back to the study. If I put in enough hours of study, I should be able to get a good grade. That's a common thought among collegiates today. If I give enough hours to this, not for your devotional life. Although, if you will, it's going to be inevitable. But not because of. You with me? Romans 8, 38. I am convicted of neither not death nor life. Read this with me. Here we go. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> See, you, you guys are approaching this way too systematic. Ah. Oh. That's, that's, that's got to be the easiest answer on the, on, on, to fill out. 1 John 5.13 These things were written to you in order that you might guess that you have that you, in order that you might know that you have what? Eternal life. So live life with the assurance of eternal life. Okay, I, I think maybe if you would let me preach on this, this would be my topic for the day. We have a, a, a generation of young people and a generation of pew fillers that don't live life with the assurance of eternal life in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They constantly question their relationship. If, if Yes, I've confessed my sins, but I don't know if they're forgiven. They don't believe the application of, of, the, of the principles of God's Word. These things were written in order that you might what? No, not, not wonder, not guess, not go up and down. You live your life with the assurance of eternal life. Okay? Let's do that. Thank you. You've been a good group.